My name's Alex Smith. I'm a solutions architect based here in Singapore. And what I'm going to talk about today is digital workloads on AWS. But actually, a lot of what I'm actually going to talk about won't just be on the workloads. It's about the culture of becoming a digital business. So let's just start off by talking a little bit about the, gen the gentleman who delivered the keynote earlier today. Dr. Werner Vogels is well known for saying that Amazon is effectively a technology company that coincidentally sells books online. If you look at the breakdown of our company, there's technologists, there's developers, there's infrastructure all within us. Amazon itself is a digital business. Now what I mean by digital businesses apply to Amazon, but also apply to our customers. All of our customers who have data, who hold some data and build their business around that are digital in some way. If we look at the startup sector, whether it's here in Singapore, across ASEAN, or even globally, these companies build their industry, they build their entire business around the data they hold and how they interact with their customers. This is true as well in the enterprise, whether you have people like Seco, who are featured in many of the videos that you'll see today, or even companies like Astro in Malaysia, you know, a very established pay TV operator. And then this also comes into the public sector. The IDA gave a talk earlier about the digital transformation that they are going through right now. But again, what does digital really mean? Now, for me, digital business is about getting value from the data that you hold. That might be companies that are inherently data-driven, a search engine, a news portal, a social media site. But it could also be a company which bridges the gap between the digital and the physical. A car company who holds information via IoT about the cars themselves. Seco, a company that moves containers around but inherently has a lot of metadata around those as well. It's about turning that data into real business value and using that within your business. And you to do this, you need to be driven by software. We're no longer in a point where anything can be manually processed. The entire value of a digital business comes from the software which actually supports that business. And because there is such a critical focus on business, which can use this data, it becomes a core part of their actual day-to-day -day operations. So let's, let's just Take this, into, um, take this into a phrase. Digital businesses build their business models as code around their data assets. This is very similar to how now we say that infrastructure becomes code. What we're doing is we're removing the manual pieces. We're codifying, we are building software around the assets and the infrastructure and the data we already held. So putting this into our key insights, the digital businesses build their, data, uh, their business models around data assets. Now that's the software, but what about hardware? Amazon is a very large infrastructure as a service cloud computing company, and I haven't talked about the hardware yet. So before I talk about that, I want to talk about old IT. Old IT often is considered the CIO-owned virtualization layer. This may look like a, what many people call private cloud. It will have a virtualization layer across many physical hosts, which goes some way to improving the efficiency of hardware use. However, this shares many problems with the same older IT. Older IT was a one-to-one -one mapping. I go into a data center, I see my database server, I see my web server. Both of these suffer from the same problem, which is a lack of flexibility an inability to scale up and down as you need. Fundamentally, this is a bottleneck. It's a legacy for us. Compared to new IT, cloud computing, the flexibility here is enormous. You receive unlimited resources. You today can run a server, and then you can run a 1,000. There isn't the financial risk that we used to see with infrastructure investments. You don't have the million dollar upfront. You pay as you go, you build as you go, and you build dynamically through software. In the same approach I'm talking about codifying your business practices, you apply the same through software like Puppet, who are exhibiting today. 
you begin to build your platform, your infrastructure, dynamically and in response to what you need. Everything that you build is also very flexible. You pay for what you use, you run, then you tear down. And you tear down globally. If you need to deploy a site today in Singapore, tomorrow in Sydney, the same day in Korea, or even in the US, all of this is available to you without the need to build a local office, the need to build a local presence. A great example of this is Netflix, who launched in over 100 countries in a single day. This simply wouldn't have been possible with any of the older IT models. And because of this, cloud means that as a business, you no longer face physical limitations for how you operate. The cloud is available to everybody, whether this is a startup in Singapore, whether this is the governments of Singapore, whether this is a company like NASA, or whether this is you today. Amazon has over a million active customers. These aren't dead signups. These are not internal accounts. These are people actually using the platform day in, day out. And as a result of this, it gives us an enormous ability to scale and to innovate, innovating at a level that few other companies can even think of. And because of this, we can pass this on to you as a customer. Because what we do is, first of all, we look at what the customers need. We look at the requests. We look at how customers use our platforms. Everything Amazon does, everything a digital business should do, should be based around that customer. But it needs to be data-driven. It needs to be based on performance. It needs to be based on understanding. And of that, we build concepts. We build ideas. We try and we innovate. Because in this case, the finance, the investment is no longer a differ differentiating factor. Infrastructure is no longer the differentiator. What becomes the differentiator is the insight, is the ability to relate to your customers. The faster you get the ideas to market, the quicker you can analyze them in real time, not waiting a week or two weeks for a batch process. It means you can innovate for your customer. You can pivot an idea. You put something live, it doesn't work, roll it back, start again. This is a flexibility that we've not had before. Amazon has been doing this as part of Amazon Web Services, but also as our e-commerce store. And the better you do this, the more successful you become. You can see in the way that Amazon has innovated year on year. Last year, we released 560, sorry, in 2014, we released 560 major new features and services. In 2015, 722. We're constantly innovating, and to date, we've released nearly 2,000 major new features and services on the platform, all in 10 years. This is an incredible innovation in response to what our customers want. But this isn't just networking, it isn't just storage, it isn't just compute. These are high-level services that allow you as a business, you as a user, to do things faster. We removed that undifferentiated heavy lifting of building a server, but not just a server anymore. Building a search engine, building a database engine. Gene talked about things like the managed database service or managed services. This is where you can focus on innovation for yourselves. So this brings us to our second codified rule. Digital businesses bring new ideas very quickly to market. The data is analyzed in real time, and ultimately you are data driven. And no matter what, your customer forms the center of what you do. You must build your business around what the customer wants and what the customer needs, even if they don't know it yet. Now, in these businesses, we need to think about bottlenecks and what will stop us innovating, what will stop us growing. And I want to talk about Amazon.com in about 2001. 15 years ago, Amazon, the core platform, was what we call a monolith. It was multi-tiered architecture, but fundamentally, it was incredibly closely coupled. What this meant was, as we want to do a release, it affected not just a small part of the website, it affected everything. This reduced our flexibility. It became an anchor around our necks. We lost the ability to very quickly innovate and quickly try new things. And this is very common in many enterprise companies. You have a code base. Everybody commits to it. You can no longer quickly try little new features, try a different login button. Because every time you deploy, you're deploying absolutely everything. So breaking this apart, moving away from this monolithic giant architecture was a big challenge for us. 
But once we got away from that problem of a monolithic architecture towards microservices, towards things that allow you to do small scope deployments, we reduced our risk. Because the more frequently you deploy, the fewer moving parts that you have to worry about. If you know that you can deploy today five times, it's not a matter of writing a big change request form or spending a week planning a change. You work on your process, you deploy very frequently. Now this may be alien to many people who come from a waterfall background. People who are very familiar with the idea of a risk mitigation plan or writing a change request and a cab and things like that. Now I'm not saying those don't fit in to digital businesses. But you do need to rethink the process. By, for instance, adopting an agile methodology, you gain the ability to very quickly, rapidly deploy major new features. But you also don't just lower your risk, you increase your learning. If you deploy a new feature today and your customers like it, well, then you can focus your efforts on that piece. If you deploy a new feature and your customers don't like it, then you know and you can refocus your efforts somewhere else. Taking an agile approach allows you to increase your learning. Really what I'm talking about is legacy being bimodal. First of all, it's a function of the architecture. You need an architecture which can support that very legacy-free rapid deployment. But secondly, it's a process, it's a culture thing. If the culture of your business is risk averse, you will end up in a situation where you feel that more control, more change control will, will prevent you from issues. Actually, a lot of the time it causes the issues because you're not prepared to try a deployment. So this gives us our final codified point for today. Digital businesses don't cling to the legacy. Now, Amazon.com in 2001 was a successful e-commerce company. We didn't throw things away, but at the same time, we were not anchored by it. We understood that we could take what we have and innovate more. And as a part of this, we adopted an innovation culture, which allowed us to rapidly develop new services and that resulted in things like Amazon Web Services itself being born in 2006. But at this point, you might ask, how do I actually get there? I am an enterprise business. I'm a, a business that has data. I run a mapping operation, a geospatial operation. I know I need to get there, but how? And often the first question is, what do I move and how do I move it? This very nicely fits with what Gene actually mentioned earlier about the three of Three steps to cloud. And first of all, you don't have to throw everything away. The legacy doesn't mean that you have to get rid and start afresh. Often you will see a price reduction simply by moving files, moving your services into the cloud. But it's going to be small. It'll be maybe 10 or up to 30%. It's not a game changer. So after things are lifted and shifted, forklift into the cloud, you can start to optimize you start to remove application components that you don't need to manage. I already said undifferentiated heavy lifting, but I've spent the last 10 years building infrastructure platforms where I had to do cabling, racking and stacking, and building NASes. These aren't things that you guys want to do when you're building a business. You can take out components, for instance, search, manage database, manage NoSQL, and queuing systems, things that are very hard to manage at scale, and you push that to us. We can manage different components of these for you, you optimize, and your total TCO drops. And once you've got your teams up to speed, they start to know how the cloud works, how the cloud functions. Then you can actually go to cloud native applications. Today you've got your application that you've moved in, you've swapped out the search, your queue system is managed. Well, what about the next application? Are you going to go back and redevelop everything and then swap out again? No. Because your developers already know this. You already have the processes around using best practices for our security. So now you can build much more efficient applications. There's many talks today around things like serverless compute. When you're building applications using these high-level platform services, you no longer need to manage huge ranges of software. So when we're thinking about which horse to build next, we need to think about the kind of workloads that we want to attack. It's very common to look at a cloud migration and think of a very complex enterprise system, and it's, it's a little bit taxing. So if we think about the horses we can back, we can start off with a simple workload, for instance, a development or test workload for an existing application. 
But one of the problems there is if your dev test environment doesn't represent prod, it increases risk. So sometimes people will look at DR or backup or even their back office applications. But today I'm going to talk about the digital workloads themselves. And this could be in many different forms. For instance, digital marketing, a customer relationship management system, EDMs, corporate sites, or even a digital asset management system. So the implementation that I've chosen to go with today is a reasonably simple brochureware site, the kind of corporate website, the default page that you put up. Now these can be tricky purely because of the scale that you have to deal with. If I'm going to put out a perfect example, a page about our summit, it's going to go globally. I will have hopefully 5,000 attendees today and I need to make sure the site is highly available, secure and easy for people to access. Traditionally, this would have taken a hosting provider, it would have taken uh, working with an SSL provider, I would have had to manage, and even then, it would have only been present in one location. So what I'm going to very quickly show, and a quick disclaimer, this is a live demo. If it goes wrong, please don't leave. I will do my best to get through it. Um, what I will do today is I will show you very quickly a live demo of taking ourselves from a couple of pages that I've pulled down to my laptop from an existing hosting provider and actually uploading those to a secure, scalable, and easy to manage platform. So first of all, I'll talk about Amazon S3. Amazon S3 is our simple storage service. It offers you incredible resiliency, redundancy, and durability. We offer 11 nines of durability on any files uploaded. This means if you upload around 10,000 objects, will lose one every 10 million years, but I don't promise you'll lose it. That's an unparalleled amount of resilience. With it being an object store, it means that every single thing you upload is done through the internet and accessible through the internet. It's perfect for this kind of workload, a brochureware workload. And for us to provision somewhere to actually uh, upload files, all we need to do is create a bucket right now. And if my internet connection is still working, it is, um, I, I can do that immediately. So I've created my um, S3 buckets and I can actually upload files here straight away. But I talked about making this globally scalable. Now, I created that S3 bucket in Singapore. Amazon has 12 regions worldwide. And when, we, when you put a file in a region, unless you explicitly tell it so, it's not going to move anywhere. You have that confidence that the data stays where you put it. But what if my users are global? Well, this is where a content delivery network, a CDN, comes in. Amazon CloudFront has 54 locations across the world where the files that your users access can be accelerated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what we call a CloudFront distribution. This configuration allows you to very easily, using S3 as the ultimate store of your files, accelerate content globally. For my origin, I need simply need to select the S3 buckets I've just created. I can choose the name which users will access this. In this case, I'm going to go for sg.demo.alexjs.im, my domain. And I've mentioned the word secure a few times. I just want to very quickly qualify that. Security is important not just because you want to give your users confidence, but as search engines start to positively weight people who take security seriously, it's almost the default now to make sure that all of your brochureware, your corporate sites, are delivered over HTTPS. And the relative cost of doing so has never been lower. Earlier this year, Amazon released Amazon Certificate Manager. ACM allows you to, for free, provision and use SSL certs on both our Elastic Load Balancer, our ELB, and on CloudFront, our CDM. And for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to request a brand new uh, ACM cert just to run through the process. ACM certs are trusted like any other SSL certs, the same as when you go to Amazon.com today. So in my case, I chose to use the domain name of sg.demo.alexjs.im. Uh, sg I choose to add that domain to a single SSL cert. I can actually have multiple domain names in one SSL cert, and I could also support wildcards if I wanted. Once I've confirmed that my name is correct, I can confirm and request this. What this will do is it will send me an email as the owner of this domain to various different email addresses, and I must then authorize and approve 
the issuing of a certificate. All being well, in my Amazon work mail, I've received a request for approval. Now if I just look quickly back in Certificate Manager, at the moment this certificate is not validated. And what this means is that when you create a new domain, when you create a new SSL cert, there's still this authentication, it's still secure. I choose to approve my ACM certs. I validate this data, I approve, and then Amazon immediately issues this SSL cert. There's not a matter of waiting for a few days for it to come through. I don't need to sign anything. It's immediately available for me. If I now go back to CloudFront, where I had just one SSL cert, I now can use my new SSL cert. I can access that immediately. And that's, that's it. If I now create this distribution, he says, quietly praying, if I now create this distribution, it's now being populated across the global CloudFront network. Now this takes about 10 to 15 minutes, so what I'm going to do to just quickly run through another bit is I'm going to put the DNS piece of the pie in here. If you're not familiar with DNS, it's the global system which maps the friendly names, like Amazon.com, to the IP addresses behind. Now, when using DNS with a CDN, it's often quite complex because of the whole integrated management piece and to be very specific technically, Apex or root records. Here I'm using root 53. Amazon's DNS service. I've already created what we call a zone, which holds all of my records in here. I haven't yet created one to match my CloudFront distribution, but I can do that simply at the push of a button. Route 53 supports the ability to alias directly to CloudFront. This means that the setup is incredibly simple, and all I need to do is choose the CloudFront distribution, which is still pushing out, so won't appear here. But what I can do is show the example I made earlier, which shows an alias to my existing CloudFront distribution. Now what this means is, I hit, in this case, summit.demo.alexjs.in, it immediately goes through a global CDN. 54 locations worldwide, incredible acceleration for your users, data still stored securely in Singapore. So with that, I'm finally going to actually upload my files. So in this case, I have two very simple files, just web pages. These are what I might pull down from my existing FTP storage. I upload those straight into CloudFront, uh, sorry, straight into S3. And when they're available and uploaded, I can see those objects. I choose to make these public because it's a very public website but S3 does support many layers of security depending on your needs. And now, if I go to that in a browser, I see the Kuala Lumpur um, agenda page. Now that was something that we've always been able to do with existing providers. But now, using the, using the link which goes through CloudFront, goes through Route 53, has an SSL cert, all effectively for free or for pennies. This is no longer a matter of, hey, we've got a new corporate site, we need to use another agency, and then they need a hosting provider. This is a very simple, effective way for us to bring lots of complex features and do it very simply, and as you saw, all through the web console. At no point did I need to break out the CLI. So now just to quickly go back to that. Starting at the end user, they have the acceleration through CloudFront, we have the S3 bucket, and we also have the SSL layer. I'm just going to switch my display back. Okay. So to wrap up, I want to reiterate and recount our business rules. But you may notice a small change here. Digital businesses don't just build business models, they build their core business models. What I said about undifferentiated heavy lifting doesn't just apply to the infrastructure. It doesn't just apply to the platforms. It applies to everything you do. Don't redo things that other people have already done. You build these models, you build these core models as code around your data assets. You bring ideas to market continually, you evaluate your data, and you make sure your customer is at the center. And finally, don't cling to legacy. Adopt it and utilize it but don't be anchored by it.
adopt where you can innovation. Now, how do I actually get there? What do I do? You need to start hiring and developing people who are fundamentally builders. These don't have to be developers. They don't have to just be coders or sysadmins. Every single profession has builders. It has the curious. It has those who are willing to innovate. They will be able to help you experiment often, iterate, listen to what your customers say, and build new things very quickly. And finally, explore innovation in process or in applications or in your culture. Look at things like DevOps architectures, uh, microservices architectures or DevOps cultures. Fundamentally, these are core to how your businesses will grow, and they will allow you to scale from that one million user up to 10 or even more. Now with that, Amazon is a very human company. We're based here in Singapore. This is our Asia Pacific headquarters. We hold regular things like user group meetups. We hold regular drop-ins for our users. Please feel free to reach out to us, ask questions. We'll be at the booths all day, and if you have any questions around digital business, around innovation, around the culture of Amazon or of digital business, get in touch. Now with that, I'd like to thank you.